a father was having devotions with his family and they were talking about the love of God and the love of Jesus while the mother was fixing the pancakes. When they finished devotions, the mother then came and took the first batch of pancakes and handed it to one of the two sons. The other son who didn't get the first batch of pancakes said, didn't you hear what daddy said? He said that uh, Jesus says that we ought to consider others better than ourselves. The son of the pancake said, well, then you be Jesus. <laughs> because it's easy to talk about this word love and uh, not either know what it is or know what to do with it. We use the word love with regard to fuzzy feelings. Sometimes we feel in our tummy toward a certain person, place, or thing. We use love to reflect on caring for something or someone. We use it very broadly to refer to anything we have good feelings about. I love chocolate cake. I love ice cream. I love this person. I love that person. I love this show. I love uh, this job. We speak of the word very, very casually because it speaks of our emotive connection to, to a noun of some sort, a person, place, or thing. But I want to take you on a journey with regard to that word that may be a little different than you're used to because we're talking about the attributes of God. We're talking about the perfections of God, the things that make him who he is. We've looked at his nature, we looked at sovereignty, we've looked at glory, we looked at holiness. But in two verses, verses 8 and verse 16, we find this phrase, in 1 John 4, God is love. God is love. In other words, any discussion about love has to start with God, for that's who he is. That's not just what he does. It is his self-definition. It's like me saying I am black or I am African American or somebody saying I am white or somebody else saying I am Hispanic. They are clarifying their identity. It's an unchangeable reality. So when God says he is love in verse 8 and in verse 16, he wants you to look at love as defining at least one part of how he defines himself. Therefore, if you really want to understand the word and you really want to understand where it comes from and you really want to understand how it works, it's best to talk to somebody who's defined by that word. God says you can define me by the word love because God is love. Well, let's discuss that a little deeper. God is an eternal being. If this is who he is, then he must have been this forever. He didn't become love. He didn't start loving. He is identified with the word. So as long as he's been around, this has been his self-definition. God is love. That means love didn't start with you. And love didn't start with me because God was love before there was a you or a me. In fact, God was love before there was time and space. Because if he is love, then he's always been love before there was anything outside of himself to love because that's, that's who he is. God is love. Well, wait a minute. If God is eternal and God is love, therefore God being love is eternal, then we've got to ask, who in the world did God love when there was nobody to love but God? Well, if there's nobody to love but God and God is love, then the only one God could love was him. Because before there was time and space, there was only God. Because he exists in a reality outside of ourselves. Well, that sounds a little self-serving. That sounds a little selfishness. Wait a minute, God. You're going to love and the only one you're going to love is you? Come on, you tell us not to be selfish. Aren't you being a little selfish when you are love and you are only loving you because there's nobody outside of you to love? So how in the world do you love you? since there's nobody outside of you before you created anything else. All right, let's rewind. Remember, God exists in three co-equal persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
So when we talk about God, we're not talking about somebody who's ever been by himself. God never has been lonely. God never has been alone. God never has been in isolation. God never has been in uh, singularity because the doctrine of Trinity means one God composed of three co-equal persons who is one in essence but distinct in personality. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. But all three together make up the one Godhead that we deem or term the Trinity. So God has always had somebody to love. But the somebody that love was in him because in him were three persons. And since in him was three persons, he had good practice in loving because they could love on each other. They made up the family called in the scripture, the Godhead. So when God, the Bible says God is love, he is operating in a context of love within himself because there are three who can love on each other. So what you have in God, since he is love, is a love fest within himself. God is loving himself. But he has other people, or other persons rather, in himself to love. Okay, it's time now for us to go deep sea diving. How in the world is God being love, loving himself? If I can refer you to St. John, we're in 1 John, but I want to take you to St. John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Jesus answered them, my father works until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. They understood he was saying, I'm equal to God. I'm, I got all the, the nature of deity. Therefore, Jesus answered and said to them, truly, truly, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you can marvel. So just as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son also gives life to whom he pleases. For not even the father judges anyone, but he's given all judgment to the son so that all will honor the son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, just from a casual reading, something going on in the Trinity. The Son says, whatever Daddy does, I do. And I don't do anything that I do until Daddy gives me permission to do it. Because the Son only does what the Father says. So the Son gives his will, the Father gives his will, the Son does it. The, the father says give life, the son does. Whatever daddy says, the son does because we, we flow like that. We're hooked up like that. Whatever the father wants, the son does. But the son does what the father wants so I, the son can bring glory back to the father. So the father wants to make a big deal about the son and the son uses a big deal that the father made about him to bring a big deal back about the father because the father loves the son. And the father loves the son so much that the father comes up with ways to make the son look good. That means glory. Glory means to publicize, advertise, or make look good. So my daddy loves me so much that he creates things that makes me look good. So when y'all see me doing the things I'm doing, he said to the Jews, it's because my daddy told me to do it because he wanted me to show off in front of you how great he is by giving me permission to do what you just saw. So daddy is investing in me because daddy loves me. The father loves the son. In fact, when you read the book of St. John, he says over and over and over again, the father loves the son. In John 3, 35, he says the father loves the son. In John 10, 17, the father loves the son. In John 15, 9, the father loves the son. In John 17, verse 23 and 24, the father loves the son. So the father loves me so much that he moves and I can't help but twitch. Our connection is so tight. This love affair that me and my daddy have is so tight that we live in love. For God is love. 
So we, this is how we roll. If you come into our environment, bam, love, bam, love, bam, love, bam, love, bam, 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 bam. bam. It's all love because that's how we roll up in here, up in here. Because that's our environment. And so the way we love each other, me and my daddy, the way we love each other is by making each other look better. So the father does something for me that makes me look better and then I roll it back to him so that he looks good by what I did that shows him off what he told me to do. So we bounce him back. Then the Holy Spirit's got to jump into the plan and the Holy Spirit comes in the plan and says, I've only come to glorify the son. So now he jumps in and we got this Trinitarian love fest that we can't shake. So since God has always had somebody to love, he's never been alone, they've always been loving on each other. God comes up with an idea. That idea is stated in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. I'll read it to you. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intentions of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. Watch this. Which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. The beloved, meaning the, the person you love, the beloved. Somebody calls somebody their beloved, the person they love. The father's referring to the son as his beloved, but then he throws a curveball. He says, but he chose us in the beloved. Okay, let me explain. The father and the son and the spirit, they're having this love fest within the Trinity, and they just loving on each other 24 hours a day, finding out how they can bring greater glory to the other person because they love the other person that much. And so the father comes up with an idea. The father says, son, I love you so much that what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a whole race of people to sing your praises. I love you so much. I want to show you how much I love you, but I'm going to use all my creative energy and I'm going to create a group called humanity. And this group called humanity has one job, to sing the, the praises of my son. The son said, Daddy, if you do that for me and all these folk that you create for me are singing my praises, I'm going to lead them into singing your praises. So when I tell them to pray, I'm not going to tell them to pray to me. I'm going to tell them to pray our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you're going to do that for me. You're going to create a whole human race designed to sing my praises. Then I'm going I'm to get the spirit to work in them so that they spring it back to you so that you'll be glorified because I was glorified by your glory in my life. And I just whip that glory back around to you and we can keep this love fest going. So the reason God created humanity was to create a group of people who would celebrate God's love for his son. It's like a, a birthday party that you show and you invite a whole bunch of guests to celebrate the person who the birthday is for. God loved his son so much that he created humanity to celebrate the glory with which he loved his son. So that you have been, he says, chosen in the beloved. You've been chosen because of his love for his boy. Now, a problem. Sin enters into the picture. Satan interferes with the party. The men who were created because Jesus is in Genesis at chapter 1. It says when... They walked with God in the garden. That means they were walking with the second person of the Trinity. The Bible says when God spoke, the Bible says that was Jesus Christ talking. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So back then, Adam and Eve, Jesus is all up in that. He says before the foundation of the world, he decided to create us. So we weren't even there, but he came up with, a, with an idea because of how much he loved his son. So he comes now, Satan comes in and he gets men to sin against God. Somebody has entered into the party uninvited to remove us from our created purpose, to bring glory to God through our relationship with the son. And he interferes with this love affair and men rebel against the living God so we got a problem 
I created these people, son, because of my love for you. And now they done gone away from me and away from you. They messing up what I did. We got to fix this. We got to fix this. But the problem is I got to deal with their sin. So 1 John 4 says God demonstrated his love toward us. He sent Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. Okay, propitiation means satisfaction. He sent Jesus Christ to satisfy the problem that was to benefit him. Okay, watch this. I created them for you. They done messed up on you, but I'm going to send you and hurt you to fix them which I made for you. So when the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, when it says that he gave his only begotten son, Verse 9, that means one of a kind, unique, in a class by himself because there's nobody who fits the description of deity but God's son, Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to send you to die for them to get them back to you so that we can keep this party going. So God sent the person that the party was for to pay the price for the folk who messed up the party. God demonstrated his love toward us, Romans 5, 8, in that while we were yet sinners, he did not wait till we got right. He loved us when we were totally wrong. He didn't wait for us to fix it. I'm going somewhere with this. He didn't wait for us to get it right. He says, you messing with me loving my son. I got to get you back. I love my son so much, I'll sacrifice him to get you back. Because I am love and I got to do something lovingly to fix this, even if it means killing my own son. Even if it means breaking up my own unity so that he can have what I made for him that's gotten broken. I'm going to do that and I can't help myself because I am love. So I got to figure out a loving way to fix this problem because that's who I am. I cannot, not, I cannot not do it because then I would like a person trying to change their race that, that I can't do that because that's who I am. And so it is in this context. The concept of God's love, John chapter 13, puts it this way. Verse 31 says, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also be glorified in himself <laughs> and will glorify him immediately. Okay, you got that? God is glorified in him and when I get glorified in him, I'm glorifying me. When I glorify me, he gets glorified and when he gets glorified, I'm more glorified. So I'm going to fix this thing so that he gets more glory when this thing is over. And then he's going to give me more glory when this thing is over because he got more glory when this thing is over. So what I'm trying to tell you is that you're caught up in something bigger. You're not just caught up in this general God is love stuff. You're caught up in a love fest. You're caught up in a Trinitarian love fest. And that's why Jesus told his father in his prayer in John 17, help them to learn to love like we love each other. When you are in eternity and there is no blockages related to sin, God is going to spend all eternity giving you a love you can feel because there will be no interruptions in it because that's who he is and that's how he rolls. So now, What's the point? Here's the point. He says in verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now stay with me here. God says, I am love. Can't help it. That's my nature. Love is seeking the best for another. Seeking the best for another. I'm seeking the best for my son. 
and seeking the best for my son, I created a human race to seek the best for him. When the human race seeks the best for him, then my son is going to give me more glory because he's going to seek the best for me. When my son seeks the best for me, I'm going to come up with new ways to seek something even better for him. Then he's going to try to outdo me by seeking something to give me more glory. Then I'm going to try to outdo him for what he tried to outdo me. And you get wrapped up in it. How? How do you get wrapped up in this love fest that existed before we were ever born? That existed before there was ever time and space, a heaven and earth. How do we get caught up in it and experience it? He says in verse 11, 1 John 4, if we so loved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now watch this. If you hang out in a flower shop, you're going to start smelling like flowers. You hang out in a flower shop, you know, that, that smell going to rub off on you. If you hang out in a perfume shop or, or area of a store with perfume and cologne, you're going to start smelling like cologne because that's where you're hanging out. In other words, your environment affects how you look or smell. God says, watch this, I am caught up in a love fest and I am love. If you are not loving, it's because you ain't hanging out in my shop. You in somebody else's shop. Because I am love. That's my store. My store is called love. If you are hanging out in that store, love is rubbing off on you. So if you are a loveless Christian, you shopping at the wrong store. Let me put it another way. God will determine how much he deals with you by how much you deal with others. Please notice the words here. This is serious business. He says in verse 8, the one who doesn't love doesn't know me. He says in verse 12, God, if, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. He says in verse 16, if the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. He says in verse 20, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So he says, forget about it. You cannot have an intimate experience with me if others can't have an intimate experience with you. If you do not know how to love or refuse to love, you won't feel my love. He restricts the experience of himself to believers who are functioning in love as a lifestyle. Okay. You're not getting this. God is love. That's who he is. So he only hangs out with love. So since he is love and he only hangs out with love, if that's not how you roll, he can't hang out with you. Because he would then be hanging out with something that's not like him. That you, who, who you are and who I am even though you're my child, because he's talking to Christians. That's why it says one another. He's, he's not talking about the world right here. He's talking about love within the family of God. That's why if the devil can make you selfish, the devil can make you hateful, the devil can make you mean and honorary and nasty and unforgiving, if he can put all of that stuff in you, he knows God's going to leave you alone because you're not hanging out where he's hanging out. He only hangs out with that which is consistent with who he is and he's already told you who he is, he is love. The word abide means to hang out. He says, if you're not abiding in love, you're not hanging out with me. So the more you love, the more you're in his hangout. The more you love, the more you're in the environment that he's comfortable with. And so if it's only about me, myself, and I, if it's only about being blessed and not being a blessing. That's why every time God talks about being blessed, he wants to know how you're going to be a blessing. Or is it only about you? 
Because if it's only about you, you're not with me. Because I don't make it only about me. I make it about my baby boy. And my baby boy makes it back about me. So if you want to hang out with us, you got to roll like we roll. And so one of the reasons that many Christians aren't experiencing God is because they are loveless saints. They don't ask the question, how can I love today? Who can I love today in the family of God? What can I do today? You can't love everybody, but you can love somebody. And that means, what does it mean to love them? To love means is the decision. It is decision. Let me state that again. It is, let me clarify something because we, we use these words wrongly. We confuse love and like. We confuse that. So let's, let's get this. Let me explain this, okay? Like is a feeling. I like you, I don't like him. Don't say I love chocolate cake. You like chocolate cake. That's how you feel about it. You like the taste. You like, so you like it. That's okay because there's some things you don't like. Biblical love, agape, is a decision regardless of an emotion. An emotion, you may love something you like, but you can also love stuff you don't like. In other words, you don't feel good about it, but you made a decision regarding it, okay? You made a decision to eat vegetables. You may not like it, but you love healthy food and nutrition. Because you love that, you choose and decide to eat what you don't like. So love is the decision to compassionately, righteously, and responsibly seek the well-being of another. God does that with his son. To love God means to passionately seek his glory. So the more glory of God you seek, the more you're loving God. And the more compassion to others you give, the more you're loving people. When God sees the compassion, he translates that to passion so that his passion can refer to your compassion so that his love can enter your love so that you can get more of him. Look at this. Look what he says. He says in chapter 3 of 1 John that if you love, he says that we ought to love, little children, verse 18, let us love not just in word and tongue but in deed and truth. Then he comes and he says, and whatever, verse 22, we ask from him because we keep his commandments, which involves love, do the things that are pleasing to him. Guess what? He says, the way to get your prayers answered is to start loving. Um, you can go to church till you blue in the face. If he doesn't see love, forget your prayer meeting. You can, you can sing songs till you blue in the face. If he doesn't see love, he says, forget your prayers. Okay? Because you're talking to me different than who I am. I am love. When I see you love, I, I, that, that gets my mojo working because that's what I'm doing all the time, 24 hours a day. So when I see you plugged into who I am, I say, oh, he being like me. If you don't think that's what he's saying, all you got to do is read verse 17. But this love is perfected within us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in the world. How is he? Love. What are you doing in the world? Being loving. He says when he sees you being a loving Christian as a way of life, he says you're being just like him in this world as he is in that world. And when he sees that, you have gotten his undivided attention. The reason why more Christians aren't hearing from God, more churches aren't seeing the transformation of the spirit, is they, they are often loveless places no matter how good the preaching is. You can't preach your way into this. You can't sing your way into this. You can't shout your way into this. You can't wave your hand in the air like you just don't care enough in this. This will only happen when God sees us individually and corporately. The number one thing that should be said about you and should be said about our church should not be the preaching, the preacher, the sermon, the choir, the singing, the gifts, the one thing that should override everything else 
is wow. Look at how they love one another. Jesus said in John 13, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Not by the preaching, not by the singing, but by the loving. Unless there is a love fest in this house, we will not see miracles from heaven. Unless there's a love fest in your house, you will not see miracles from heaven. We can look, you know, I saw a lady again a few days ago and I embarrassed myself. I said, how far along are you? She said, she ain't pregnant. That's embarrassing. But she looked pregnant to me. She looked pregnant to me. Simple part is you can, you can look the part but have no life. You can look the part, you can carry the Bible, use the Christian words, but the life that is bred by love, if that is missing, if that is missing, it's like the prodigal son. The prodigal son. And remember, God demonstrated his love to us when we didn't deserve it. Not when, it's easy to love folk that you think deserve it. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died when we didn't deserve it. Okay, the prodigal son was wild. He had wild out. and He now coming back home to Papa. Coming back home to Daddy. He said, I have sinned. Daddy said, okay, now you've gotten right with me. Now you've confessed your sins. Now, you, now you're doing right. We're going to throw a party. But then there was the older brother. The older brother went to Papa and said, what you doing? What you doing? You throwing a party for him? He didn't go in there and act a fool, and you throwing a party for him? That ain't right. You throwing a party for him, and, and I'm, I've been here with you all the time. What you doing, Daddy? The father looked at the older brother and said, this is your brother who was lost, who has been found, and he came home. So I got to throw a party for him. Because I don't know about you, but I'm glad he's home. What's interesting about Luke 15 and the prodigal son is the story ends right there. You never know what the older brother does. The point being, he's got to decide now whether he's going to hang out with daddy or not. Because daddy is going to hang out with the brother that's come home. But see, a lot of older Christians don't want to hang out with folk who've been forgiven, who've been redeemed. Don't want to hang out with compassion for those whose lives have been broken and beaten. When you see somebody walk through this door and life has not been good to them, like they've been toe up from the flow up, you see somebody walk through this door and their clothes are raggedy and maybe they're ashamed by their history, their background, their lifestyle, but they walk through because they want to hear a word from the living God Don't think you better. Uh-uh, because you were no better when Jesus died for you. In fact, if it wasn't for Jesus, you would have been walking through the door looking like that. Because some of us have been dug out of some real low pits. Maybe it wasn't that, but it was something else. You take the stand. You never dumb down the word of God. But what you do is love people with a standard. You love people with a standard who are willing to adjust to that standard. And when you go to either one of those streams, see, when you love without truth, when you love without truth, then that becomes emotional sentimentalism. But when you have truth without love, then you have cold orthodoxy. The idea is to speak the truth with love so that folk know we care, but I gotta tell you what God says. I'm not gonna change what God says, but I'ma love you while I tell it to you. It is the absence of love that has kept God's church separated and segregated. It's the absence of love that's made 11 o'clock on Sunday morning the most segregated hour in America. It is the absence of love that's got black Christians against white Christians against Hispanic Christians. And it was the absence of love that created the civil war. Because if the church was the church, you wouldn't have had a civil war because they would have stood up for the truth of God. But because 
People either want to love without truth or have truth without love. They do not live based on a biblical standard. And it's time for Christians to stand up for the truth and not for the culture. And, and here's, you know, here's what God says. He said, look, if I see you loving, not accepting sin, no, we judge sin as sin. But when we see you loving the sinner, particularly in your, who's your brother. He says, when I see you loving, it's like, it's like Alka-Seltzer. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. When I see you loving, then I get all fizzy inside and I say, I, I got to do something. I got to fix something. I got to intervene something because those folk are, are doing something like me and I want to I wanna unveil myself to them. Let me give you some of the best news in the house. Best news in the house. Here's, here's one of the best news in the house. When, I, when I'm watching football, when the kids were small and I'm watching the Cowboys and I'm, I'm really into it and there's a great play, like a great tackle, I start tackling the kids. I start tackling the kids. I see, boom, I hit, bam. I bet, but you know what? And, and, and I know that ain't right. But I'm so into the game. It's like I'm on the field. Sometimes I couldn't watch it too long because it would just, just do something to me, make me want to get out there again like I did in the old days. It just, just does something to me. And so, so I would be hitting the kid. they say, cut that out, stop that, you know? Well, what you doing? What you doing? I'm just so into the game because I'm so much a part. God says, I want you so into me that when I move, you move. When I react, you react. I want you so into me that that when you see me rolling, you roll. Because we're that connected. And then, then it gives you the best news. The best news I can close with today. Because the best news I can close with today is in verse 17, he says, that you may have confidence in the day of judgment. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, that's, this, is, this is, this is good. He says, when you stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, and he reviews your tape from the time of your salvation to the time of your death. And he rolls your tape. You're in your private booth and he says, this is your life. From the time of your conversion to the time of your death, I'm going to roll your tape. On everybody's tape, there's going to be good, bad, and ugly. There are going to be some things you're proud of. There are going to be some things you're ashamed of that you've either thought or acted or did. And you're going to go, ooh, ah, Lord, I'm so sorry. How can you sit on the day of judgment, he says, and have confidence that I'm going to come out of this, this interview all right, that I'm going to come out of this interview with some rewards, that I'm going to come out of this interview having here well done, my good and faithful servant. How do I know that interview is going to work on my behalf? He says, you will have confidence in the day of judgment because you were as me in the world. And he says, I am love. That was his whole point in verse 18. So he's going to give you extra credit for every time he saw you loving somebody. He's going to give you extra credit every time he saw you reach out to somebody who could do nothing for you in return. He's going to give you extra credit by helping somebody who was sick that you didn't even know. He's going to give you extra credit by your service in the family of God to make it good for other people. He's going to give you extra credit that when he blessed you, you use your blessing to bless somebody else. He says that on that day, after your score comes in a 20 on a scale of 100, but he looks at your extra credit, you'll be able to sit there and say, God, check my extra credit. You gave me an extra credit assignment and I want you to take my 80 over to my 20 and score me 100 because I got a whole line of extra credit love going on up in here, up in here. The other day I was on the highway and all the cars got backed up and I was stuck on the highway. I looked to my left and folk are going down the HOV lane. 
just flying by the HOV lane. I'm stuck in traffic. I can't go nowhere. They just flying by. They got their own private road flying by. But the reason they could do that is because they weren't traveling by themselves. They had somebody else with them that gave them special access to their destination. God says, if I can see somebody else with you, and I can see that you're being used of me to touch somebody else, I'll let you flow and answer prayer. I'll let you flow in powerful experience. I'll let you abide in me because you're hanging out in Mr. God's neighborhood. 